Kubernetes One Container Orchestration War. It's not just used to run stateless applications. It's also commonly used in data science to create ETL pipelines that extract, transform, and load data using Spark, Flink, or Airflow frameworks. Plus, it's used to train machine learning models using open source projects like Kubeflow. If you're a developer, DevOps, or even a data scientist, you have to know at least basics of how Kubernetes operates. In this video, we'll cover basic concepts like pods, nodes, containers, deployments, and clusters. We'll also touch on ingress and load balancers. Let's start with a node, which is the smallest unit of computing hardware in Kubernetes cluster. A node is a single machine where your applications run. It could be a physical server in a data center or a virtual machine in a public cloud like AWS or Azure. You can even build Kubernetes from multiple Raspberry Pis. Thinking of a machine as a node gives us a level of abstraction. Now you don't have to worry about unique characteristics of a single server in your cluster, like its memory or CPU capacity. Instead, you can let Kubernetes decide where to deploy your service based on the specifications you provide. Also, if something happens to your single node, it can be easily replaced. Kubernetes will automatically take care of redistributing load, while it can sometimes be useful to work with individual servers that's not a Kubernetes way. In general, you or the software shouldn't worry about where it will run. Many nodes are grouped into something called a node pool. When you deploy application, Kubernetes will inspect each node and choose one based on things like available CPU and memory capacity. If that node fails for some reason, Kubernetes will make sure your application is moved and kept running. You can have different groups of nodes, sometimes called instance groups or node pools in your Kubernetes. For instance, you might have 10 nodes with high CPU but low memory for applications that need a lot of computing power. Another group might have a lot of memory, but less CPU power. In cloud computing, it's common to separate node pools into two types – on-demand nodes, which are available when you need them, and spot nodes, which are cheaper but can be taken away at any time. Since application running in your Kubernetes is not guaranteed to always run on the same node, you cannot use local disk to save data. If your app saves something on the local disk and then gets moved to another node, that saved data won't be there anymore. That's why the local disk can only be used for temporary cache storage. To persist data, Kubernetes uses something called persistent volumes. While the CPU and memory resources of all nodes are pooled and managed by Kubernetes cluster, persistent file storage isn't. Instead, you can attach local or cloud drives to the cluster as persistent volume. You can think of it as plugging external hard drive into the cluster. Persistent volumes provide a file system that can be mounted to the cluster without being associated with any particular node. To run application on the Kubernetes cluster, you need to package it as a Linux container. Containerization allows you to create self-contained Linux execution environments. Any application and all its dependencies can be bundled up into a single image that can be easily distributed. Anyone can download the image and deploy it on their infrastructure with minimal setup required. Creating a Docker images is usually a part of the CI CD pipeline. You clone the repository, run some unit tests, and then build an image. While it's possible to add multiple applications in a single container, you should aim to limit yourself to one process per container, if possible. It's better to have many small containers than one large one. If the container has a tight focus, updates are easier to deploy and issues are simpler to debug. Kubernetes doesn't run containers directly. Instead, it wraps one or more containers into a higher level structure called a pod. Any containers in the same pod 
will share the same resources and local network. Containers can communicate with other containers in the same pod as they were on the same machine, while maintaining a degree of isolation from others. Pods used as the unit of replication in Kubernetes. If your application needs to scale up, you simply increase the number of pods. Kubernetes can be configured to automatically adjust the scale of your application based on the load. You can use CPU, memory, or even custom metrics such as number of requests to the application. Typically, you would run multiple instances of the same application to prevent downtime if something happens to a single node. As a container can have multiple processes, a pod can contain multiple containers. However, since pods are scaled up and down as a unit, all containers in a pod must be scaled together, regardless of their individual needs. This can lead to wasted resources and a higher cost. To avoid this, pods should be kept as small as possible, typically containing only a main process and its closely associated helper containers, which we typically call sidecars. Pods are the basic unit of computation in Kubernetes, but they are not typically created directly in the cluster. Instead, Kubernetes provides another level of abstraction, such as deployment. The primary purpose of a deployment is to declare how many replicas of a pod should be running at any given time. When a deployment is added to the cluster, it automatically spins up a requested number of pods and then monitors them. If a pod fails, the deployment will automatically recreate it. Using a deployment, you don't have to deal with pods manually. You can just declare the desired state of the system and it will be managed for you automatically. So far, we have learned about some core components in Kubernetes. We can run application in the cluster with a deployment, but how do we expose our service to the internet? By default, Kubernetes provides isolation between pods and the outside world. If you want to communicate with a service running in a pod, you have to open a channel for communication. There are multiple ways to expose your service. If you want to expose application directly, you can use the load balancer type. It will map one application per load balancer. In this case, you can use almost any kind of protocol. TCP, UDP, gRPC, WebSockets, and others. Another popular approach is ingress controller. There are many different ingresses available for Kubernetes, each with different capabilities. When using ingress controller, you would share a single load balancer among all your services and use subdomain or path to direct traffic to a particular application within a cluster. Ingresses only allow you to use HTTP and HTTPS protocols. Also, they are more complicated to set up and maintain over the time than simple load balancers. If you want to learn more about differences between node port, load balancer, and ingress, I have a dedicated video on my channel. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.